Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Christina Ma, and today's topic is What Happens to a Prosecution Deferred? DOJ's Approach to Criminal Investigations. In Episode 2 of Our Curious Amalgam, we explore the DOJ's leniency program, whereby corporations or individuals who are the first to self-report illicit cartel or other antitrust criminal activity may receive leniency and avoid prosecution altogether. In this episode, we discuss another way in which potential defendants can avoid prosecution through what are called Deferred Prosecution Agreements, or DPAs. Joining me today is my co-host, Matt Harper. Hi, Matt. Uh, Thanks for having me, Christina. So what are we talking about today? Today, we are talking about deferred prosecution agreements. Uh, You know, the Department of Justice sometimes agrees to delay its case against certain criminal defendants, often in exchange for their cooperation. Uh, You know, but historically, the Antitrust Division has not used deferred prosecution agreements as readily as other divisions. You know, that fact may be changing, in view of the division's 2019 guidance on corporate compliance programs and its infinite uh, leniency policy, which we explored in our second ever episode. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the division's historic deferred prosecution agreement practice and how it may be changing in the future. Great. Uh, Matt, who's our guest today? We've got a real gem today. Our guest today is John Jacobs, a partner and antitrust trial lawyer at Perkins Coie. John represents both corporate and individual clients in civil and criminal antitrust investigations and cases. But for 27 years, he was a trial attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division. There, he investigated and tried both civil and criminal cases. John was the lead trial attorney in the government's successful challenge of Anthem's proposed merger with Cigna back in 2016. He is currently a vice chair of the ABA Antitrust Section's Cartel and Criminal Practice Committee, and has taught trial in, in litigation advocacy with both the National Institute of Trial Advocacy and the Department of Justice National Advocacy Center. John, welcome to Our Curious Amalgam. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. We're glad to have you. Um, so you know, what is a deferred prosecution agreement? Uh, Thanks for having me, Matt and Christina. Uh, A deferred prosecution agreement is is an agreement between the government and a company that has committed a criminal antitrust violation. Uh, The company agrees to pay a fine, agrees to cooperate with the government's ongoing investigation, but the prosecution of the case itself is deferred. That's, That's where the name comes from. So what that means is Uh, An information and the DPA is filed in court, but there's no plea hearing. There's no sentencing. And then after a certain amount of time goes by, and and these agreements usually run for, you know, something like two to three years, as long as the company has lived up to its end of the bargain, the case is just dismissed. So it's similar to a plea agreement in that you pay a fine, you cooperate, there's usually protection for your employees who cooperate. The major difference and the main benefit to the company is that it doesn't actually result in a criminal conviction. You know, and I should probably back up here. I imagine most of our uh, listeners haven't been subject to criminal investigation by the antitrust division. Uh, do you think you could take a moment and just explain to us what exactly we're talking about when the Department of Justice is investigating uh, criminal offenses under the antitrust laws? Sure. It, I, as you know, Matt, uh, the antitrust division has both civil and criminal law enforcement responsibility. The division brings criminal cases when it finds agreements between competitors that are per se unlawful. So things like price fixing agreements or bid rigging or allocating customers or markets, very different types of cases than the civil antitrust cases, which involve things like mergers or uh, you know, unilateral conduct in the market by a single firm. I see. and. Um- you mentioned that these deferred prosecution agreements are, are similar to sort of, uh, plea agreements, which is probably something a lot of listeners are more familiar with. Are there, are there other tools that the division uses aside from the deferred prosecution agreements to uh, work with criminal defendants who may be part of these investigations? 
Sure. Well, there's uh, any number of ways they can, uh, for companies that are not cooperative, of course, they can be indicted and the division will will take them to trial. The plea agreements are where there is actually a, a criminal uh, conviction. Uh, ways in which the division works with companies to avoid a conviction you know, there are still several ways to do that. Obviously, the, it, you know, the division could decide there's no conspiracy at all yeah. uh, or that the company, this particular company wasn't a part of it. And that's the best possible outcome because the investigation is just closed and, and that's it. Um, there's leniency, which you've mentioned uh, before. And I know you had the previous show on the leniency policy, which applies when a company is the first one to tell the government about the conspiracy, or, or at least is the first one to cooperate. Um, and under that policy, if you meet the criteria, there's no case at all filed against you, and, and you don't even pay a criminal fine, but you still do have to cooperate with the government's investigation. Um, DPAs are another way. Uh, there's also something called non-prosecution agreements or NPAs. So we've got a lot of acronyms here. Uh, NPAs are similar to DPAs in that the company cooperates, pays a fine, escapes a conviction. The main difference is that with an NPA, there's no case at all filed in, in federal court. There's just an agreement between the government and the company, usually in the form of a letter. So those are some of the ways in which the division uh, can work with a company to avoid uh, a, a criminal conviction. And why would the department want to do that? Why would the, it would seem that the if you're looking and doing spending the resources on a criminal investigation, you want to bring that conviction for the American people. Uh, why have these other programs? Well, the goals... Uh, really depend on which method you're talking about. You know, the, for example, the goals of the leniency program are very different from the goals of uh, deferred prosecution agreements. With leniency, that program is designed to make criminal conspiracies more unstable and to create incentives for a member of the cartel to run into the division and self-report. And, and it, it has been a very successful program for the antitrust division, generating the vast majority of its uh, criminal cases since at least the mid-1990s. In fact, when I, when I was with the division, virtually all of the investigations and cases I worked on as a criminal prosecutor came to us through the leniency program. Mm. The goals of DPAs are very different. Uh, they, in part, come out of the principles of federal prosecution, mm -hmm. which recognize that there can be collateral consequences to a criminal conviction. For a corporation, there can be, you know, well, innocent employees, uh, innocent shareholders. Um, they didn't take part in the conspiracy, and, and they would be hurt by the effects of a conviction. The company can also be, in some cases, just disqualified from competing in certain markets. And, and that's really the, the reason why the antitrust division has used DPAs uh, so far in industries like uh, banking and, and healthcare and pharmaceuticals. If you're convicted of a felony, that has serious consequences in, in the healthcare area you're automatically excluded from participating in the Medicare or Medicaid programs, which itself is an anti-competitive outcome. So mm -hmm. that's something the antitrust division, whose mission is to promote competition, has tried to avoid. And um, we mentioned briefly that uh, the antitrust division hasn't always employed these DPAs as significantly as some of the other divisions of the Department of Justice. Um, why is that? Yeah, historically, they have been exceptions to the rule. Uh, I think that's in large part because of the leniency program, uh, mm -hmm. which, as I mentioned, has been the source of so many cases. Uh, because it's been so effective, the division has tried to be very protective of it, uh, tried to avoid anything that would lessen the effectiveness of it. Um, so why has it been effective? Well, the leniency program provides a very big incentive 
uh, to the first one to cooperate. No criminal charges, no criminal fines. And for everyone else, there are big punishments, you know, criminal convictions, large fines. So historically, DPAs were seen as lessening <laughs> that contrast between being the first in, the first to cooperate, uh, and everyone else. And so I think that's the main reason why the antitrust division has used DPAs and, and NPAs a lot less than other parts of the Department of Justice. You know, but in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a change to that. What's uh, driving that change? Well, I would say three things. First, the division started investigating conspiracies in industries where the collateral consequences are greater. So in 2011, in the muni bonds investigation, we saw several NPAs with banks. In 2013, then in LIBOR, we saw another DPA with a bank. And then in the past couple of years, we've seen um, some with generic pharmaceutical companies, uh, one with a medical oncology practice. So that's one reason, just the nature of the industries in which they're investigating. Second, about a year and a half ago, the division announced a new initiative on antitrust compliance programs. At the time, there wasn't uh, a whole lot of guidance out there on what's effective, what's not, in part because the division's policy had always been that an effective compliance program is one that prevents the violation in the first place. If you get caught, your program, by definition, wasn't effective. And so it didn't give any credit to a company that had tried hard but had failed to prevent a violation. Well, that changed in the summer of 2019. The division decided it wanted to encourage companies to adopt good comprehensive compliance programs. So it came out with some guidance on uh, what that would look like. And it said to encourage companies to, to do that, if you've got a good program, you might be able to earn a DPA. Now, I would argue we haven't seen any compliance program DPAs yet, but that has created, that new policy has created a second way to earn one. And then third, in January 2021, the division entered into a DPA in its ready mix concrete investigation, uh, not because of collateral consequences and not, it appears, because of a good compliance program. I say that because according to the filings, it looks like the conspiracy had continued for five years after the defendant acquired the relevant business uh, and that the defendant agreed under the DPA to enhance its compliance procedures. So at first glance, it looks more like a situation where the company needed to do more not that what it had already been doing was enough to earn a DPA under that new policy. Interesting. So why a DPA in that case? What jumped out at me in the agreement is that the illegal conduct was limited to a small number of employees. Uh, they worked in a local sales office and they, you know, the business was responsible for only 1% of the defendant's revenues. So this may be a third way to earn a DPA by showing that the conduct is just a small percentage of your overall business. What do you see the benefits of these agreements to be? Well, certainly for companies that get a DPA, uh, there's a benefit. They escape the criminal conviction and everything that comes with that. That said, the, the DPA is still public and the company's reputation in the market will still almost certainly suffer to some extent. Um, benefits to the government, uh, it, it's able to get almost everything it would get in a typical case. It gets the cooperation, it, it gets the fine. For consumers in the market in general, um, you know, DPAs certainly do lessen the risk of a collateral consequence that 
that could mean one less competitor in the market. So I, I do see, you know, some benefits to DPAs. Are there any drawbacks that we're missing? The one I'd highlight is the question of fairness. So when, when you have one of these collateral consequence DPAs, it's a fair question to ask, should we give this kind of break only to companies in certain industries like banking or healthcare? Because there are consequences for any company that is investigated and charged by the division. There are reputational costs, if nothing else, and, and those can be pretty significant. In fact, one of the companies that was charged and pled guilty in one of my grand jury investigations pulled out of the market. It's just stopped making the relevant product. And then looking at this most recent DPA where the conduct uh, was a small part of the defendant's business, uh, that too comes up in a lot of cases. I heard that argument frequently when I was with DOJ. And the way we handled it back then was we accounted for the small amount of commerce that was affected uh, in the, the volume of commerce calculation. Under the sentencing guidelines, the volume of affected commerce is the big driver of how big a corporate fine is. So again, a question of fairness. Now, maybe this is another policy change and the division will consider DPAs in all such cases from now on. We'll see. But it's definitely a new development. What about leniency? Do you think the increased use of DPAs will have an effect on leniency applications? Well, that has been the big debate, the effect on leniency. And, and my own opinion is that any effect on the number of leniency applications is probably relatively small. Uh, most of the DPAs we've seen so far have been in, in those few industries where there are clear collateral consequences like banking or healthcare. And it could be that we'll see more uh, of them outside those industries. Uh, we just don't know. But Regardless of what industry you're in, leniency is still a much better deal compared to a DPA. With leniency, you don't pay a fine. Uh, with a DPA, you do. With leniency, there's uh, the prospect of paying just single damages instead of treble damages in follow-on civil cases. With a DPA, you do not get that benefit. So I think there are still incentives to self-report. Um, ha has there been a decline in leniency applications? Yes, probably. But I think the, the reasons for that probably come from, from other factors other than DPAs. Do you think we'll see a lot more DPAs in the future? I think, yes, we'll continue to see more collateral consequence DPAs when the division finds a violation in an industry like banking or healthcare, it's still not clear how the guidance on corporate compliance will be applied. When you read that guidance, one of the questions that prosecutors are supposed to ask at the outset is, did the antitrust compliance program detect and facilitate prompt reporting of the violation? Well, unless the company is first in as the leniency applicant, the question to the answer to that question may be no. That seems to be the same standard that the division applied before. If you find it, report it. If you didn't find it, your program wasn't effective. So it'll be interesting to see how that guidance is actually applied in the future. And then with respect to this most recent DPA, that's also a real question. If the division, uh, is open in the future to other DPAs when the illegal conduct is just a small part of the business. Yeah, that could really increase the number that we see. And John, when, um, when a DPA is issued, what public record is made? So is, is the DOJ, for example, describing the circumstances under which the DPA was issued such that the more of these that occur, the more guidance that will be provided to to individuals who may be, or individuals or corporations who may want to take advantage of a DPA? Uh, they often do. In, in a recent uh, DPA, the um, division came out with a, a, a press report explaining why 
they issued a DPA in this uh, area, you know, and the sub text of that was don't get your hopes up. You, you know, we're not handing out DPAs in the normal course of our business. You know, here it was clear that um, uh, issuing a DPA would disqualify uh, the defendant from major uh, federal programs. It would essentially be a death sentence. It would be an anti-competitive outcome itself. You know, where they don't come out with the press briefings, often within the DPA, there will be an acknowledgement it w- between the government and the defendant that a criminal conviction would have a disastrous effect. So that's always a, a, a part of these. Whether uh, we will see that in any future DPA uh, acknowledging the the uh, effective compliance program, it'll be, again, interesting to see whether that happens. Right. And, and to your point earlier, there's sort of a small window of time, presumably, in which an individual could come forward, it would sort of be between the leniency participant coming forward and the time in which others become aware that an investigation is ongoing or happening. I guess I don't know what, what time frame that usually occurs under, but. Right. Um, you know, the division has, has said that the race for leniency has often been won just in a matter of hours. Uh, I suppose if you have a situation like that, that would be a, uh, a good situation in which to apply the DPA policy, but the question would be, what led the second company to come in and report? Was it the compliance program or was there some meeting of the cartel uh, where that company noticed that there was one empty chair? Right. You right. don't know. <laughs> Well, John, very, very interesting. Um, thank you again for, for joining us today. Bef- before we let you go, however, um, we always like to ask all of our guests uh, two questions. The first is to tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't know about you if we just knew you professionally. Well, I am a Michigander originally. And in college, I spent two summers working on Mackinac Island, Michigan, uh, as a guide in uh, at Fort Mackinac. So I dressed up as a 1796 American soldier. Uh, I shot muskets, I shot cannons and gave tours. And it was, you know, a great, really fun job. And I'll say also a great uh, start for anyone who wants a career in public speaking. I, I felt like I started learning the importance of pacing and keeping an eye on my audience in that job. It was great fun. Do you still have the costume? I don't. Uh, I wasn't allowed to keep the costume. And I've tried to avoid uh, friends and family getting a hold of photos of myself in the costume. <laughs> well, John, you can't see me, but when you said you're a Michigander, I, I put my hands up to say, where, where in Michigan are you from? Um, I am from Lansing, Michigan. Okay. Very cool. I don't actually know where that is in, in, in the hand, unfortunately. I just know that that is something that Michiganders do. <laughs> Right, yes, right in the middle of the the mitten, capital city. (laughs) Um, And John, what advice do you have for students or younger lawyers looking to do what you do? Um, Well, I have a couple of ideas. I I do think that spending part of your career in the government is really valuable. Um, You know, in and of itself, public service and representing consumers is a great thing to do with your law degree, and and you get to work on some great investigations and cases. Um, But if you want to also later move to private practice, I think it gives you tremendous insight into how the antitrust agencies work and that can be a great help. So that would be number one. And number two, of course, join the ABA antitrust section. We've got some great materials to help you build your expertise and your practice. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll second that as well. Um, And now to our final segment, what we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. So, John, I'm going to ask you to pick number one to 25. I will pick the number eight. Number eight. Okay. Um, If you could describe your perfect weekend, what would it look like? I would uh, go to the beach 
and sit on the beach and build sandcastles. I still do that as uh, as an adult. Um, watch the waves come in and read a book under a beach umbrella. Ocean beach or lake beach? Ocean. <laughs> Are you out there with the plastic buckets making your sandcastle, or are you a master scar- sculptor that I've seen? Then? I am just a, a plastic bucket guy and a, and a shovel, although I did see uh, a demonstration once uh, by a guy who claimed to be the world champion sandcastle builder. And if you saw him uh, do what he did, um, you would you would believe that. It's, it's amazing what you can do with sand. They use hairspray, is that right? I- I remember when I was younger, they would use hairspray to keep things in place. I did not see uh, hairspray being used. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's cheating. I don't know. <laughs> well, John, thank you again uh, for joining us today on our episode of Our Curious Amalgam. And to our listenership, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at OurCuriousAmalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.